cool topic because uh, it has to do with Africanized honeybees. Uh, how many of you have ever been to an area where Africanized bees live? Oh, okay. So about 10 of you. All right. So for the rest of you, I'm just gonna tell you about some of the biology and what uh, strategies the Africanized honeybee has used that have made it so successful uh, in the Americas. But first, I want to kind of talk about how infamous this little um, uh, type of bee has become. There have been several movies about the killer bee, killer swarm, the savage bees, deadly invasion, the swarm, the deadly bees. Actually, our, our entomology students uh, always put together a Halloween movie uh, event, which is happening, I think, tonight uh, in our university. And they, they chose uh, Killer Bee as the movie they're going to show uh, this Halloween. So there, there's always these very C-rated uh, movies about uh, deadly insects. And of course, the Africanized honeybee has been one of those that um, has gotten a lot of infamous attention uh, for, in some regards, and some necessary attention for, for others. So let's kind of remember what the, geo, the general uh, generalization or classification of the races of Apis mellifera, the honeybee. There's uh, four different branches of honeybees that are um, uh, generalized or, or classified as being either in the A branch, the African of tropical adapted uh, species, M, which uh, uh, refers to the northern European bees are winter adapted. C, refer to the Mediterranean bees. Ligustica, for example, belongs to that group. And O, or Near East, um, uh, includes uh, bees like uh, the Caucasica bees. So there's some striking aspects of honeybee biology that the variability within and between races of Apis mellifera has a lot to do with how they behave, how their morphology is, and how their physiology, um, how different they are physiologically. There are a lot of different differences that can be um, observable, some of them that are not, and that for that you need to do a lot of genetic tests. But typically for the strains, we uh, have either identified these differences um, visually, as I said, or morphometrically, and we also have these hybrids, and so it's difficult to assess these differences if we see hybrids. But we see differences in color, size, the length of the tongue varies amongst different strains of Apis mellifera, how be, uh, defensive the bees are, um, what their nesting biology is, and the dialects of the dance language, so the, sur the round and waggle dance, for instance, and how susceptible they are to disease and also how frequently they swarm. And so all of these strains of, uh, or subspecies of Apis mellifera have different differences in all of these factors. That nature, uh, natural variability is not surprising because all each of these races has evolved in an area that is geographically isolated and has completely different ecological uh, factors uh, that are suited for a specific strain. The same happens with the African bees. They, are, they have developed strategies that are better suited to those uh, climates and environmental conditions in the continent of Africa. So for centuries, beekeepers like ourselves have taken advantages of all of these differences in strains <laughs> and have used some of those qualities, uh, for example, gentleness or color or uh, ability to withstand winter conditions or the opposite of those, uh, to our advantage, depending on where we are and what we want from uh, beekeeping in general. So a lot of those differences in uh, characteristics in Apis mellifera express the influence of the seasonal factors, climate, resource abundance, and how we keep bees and for what reasons we keep bees. There are obvious differences between wintering and tropical bees that we can put into some categories. So we have uh, wintering honeybees that typically have a curtailed or stopped brood reading, uh, rearing cycle during the winter. Adult longevity rises, so typically wintering bees are longer lived than summer bees. 
and the workers and the uh, queen become quiescent, forming a winter cluster to generate heat from stored honey. And also, as you saw from the previous talk, there are no drones during the winter season in the wintering um, strains of Apis mellifera. Whereas uh, for tropical honeybees, you have the ability to, in some cases, keep bees like that year <laughs> round without wearing any winter clothing or uh, wrapping your colonies for the quiescent winter period. So winter to people and uh, beekeepers in, in tropical areas is very different than the winter in, in temperate areas because winter typically means the area, uh, the time of year when there is rainfall available and therefore nectar and resource abundance. So in this case, rainfall is what determines seasonality. And the season is reflective of the flowering, nectar, and pollen dearth periods. Also, interestingly, there's higher predation um, pressures in the tropics, not just for honeybees, but for all, all species, basically. And so because there's higher predation risks, these species or subspecies have developed these really cool strategies of um, more aggressive and uh, proactive behavior to combat all of these pr uh, pressures. So the honeybee really has become this hybrid of many populations. Uh, this is a very common map from uh, Winston that shows the major subfamilies of Apis mellifera depending on where they came from. The major imports in the United States uh, over 200 years ago were uh, Apis mellifera ligustica, carnica, and mellifera. And the major imports to South America were different, were Apis mellifera intermissa, Iberica, and all the other European species. So there was a little bit of more um, variety in the, sub, uh, the strains that were brought to uh, uh, South America as far as Apis mellifera strains. And let's remember where this particular area, Scutellata, is the subspecies of what later became the, uh, the African uh, part of the hybridization process. So how does this hybridization process occur? It all started in 1956 in Brazil. They had, uh, in, some, in Sao Paulo, which is kind of in the south region of, of, well, relatively southern region of Brazil, they were having issues with honey production in that area of, of the continent. So the European hybrids that they were using were not surviving well in the part of Brazil. They had seen poor honey production, poor sustainability of nests, and so they hired one of the researchers, uh, the leading re researchers in Brazil, to explore if he could provide um, Brazil with a type of bee that could be hybridized with their existing European hybrids um, to create a bee that would be more hardy and would uh, withstand the, the tropical area better. So this is a very famous or infamous gentleman, Dr. Warwick Kerr, who was hired by the Brazilian government to breed a more suitable honeybee in that part of, of Brazil. He's still alive and he's a, a very well-known scientist for many, many reasons. So he went and collected several queens from South Africa. He decided that that was the part where he wanted to go and collect some of these bees. And about 35 African queens were introduced into Brazilian colonies. If you read more about this whole process of the Africanization uh, of the bee, honeybees in South America, you will learn that originally he had been commissioned to go and obtain bees from different strains in South America and South Africa and in that area of Af the southern um, parts of Africa, but then the quarantine, there were quarantine issues and permit issues, and so after he had already collected most of these queens to be brought back to Brazil, they stopped them at customs, and a lot of the queens that he had collected for weeks and weeks died in transit, and the only ones that he was able to bring into um, the Americas were these bees from South Africa, and so that already uh, kind of uh, created this genetic bottleneck because there was only one strain of bees that he was able to get through uh, into Brazil. So originally 26 of those queens were released, but their queens, queen excluders got removed by some 
uh, beekeeper or man-made uh, kind of mistake or glitch in the instructions of what was supposed to happen. And additionally, some queens were reared from the remaining colonies and distributed to beekeepers in a more controlled way. Immediately after this happened, a feral population of a hybrid between those European hybrid bees that they had there and the, in these queens of Apis mellifera scutellata um, uh, background were, was created in Brazil and thus the Africanized honeybee, what we know now as the Africanized honeybee was born. Not to be confused with African bee. So in the United States, maybe here it also uh, people kind of mistake the two words and use them interchangeably, but you should not talk about the African bee as the bee that we have in, in America, for example, because it is a hybrid between bees that have um, maternal ancestry of African descent combined with maternal ancestry from European descent. So it's an, a hybrid, an Africanized honeybee hybrid, instead of saying it that it's a fully uh, African bee. So then that happened in, in 1957. And then AHB from now on, it's Africanized honeybee. It spread from 1957 from here in this area of Rio Claro in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And then it radiator, radiated kind of in concentric circles, northward and then westward. And this graph shows how, how many years it took for the Africanized bee to start moving to all parts of South America. So it took about 25 years for the Africanized honeybee to migrate from this area of the initial release all the way to the outer parts of, uh, northern parts of South America, Brazil, Colombia, and Ecuador. By the way, I'm from Colombia, so all of Colombian honeybees are now fully Africanized. There was about a three uh, to 500 kilometer per year uh, movement and population growth of this very successful hybrid. One of the things that they were very successful at is what, that they had a really high uh, colony density. So in the wild, feral honeybee colonies tend to have a lower density, so number of colonies per unit um, of area is much lower than that of Africanized honeybees. So they could have as many as 100 colonies per kilometer square, which is very high. And they were not very terribly different from the European bees in their suitable um, climates as far as where you would find European honeybees in all of these countries, they would be able to go and take over. So they were wildly successful as feral populations. I teach in Texas, uh, which is, uh, has a, a, a border with northern Mexico. And so we can take that map further north. So you can see here, 19, uh, 1982 started going to Central America, 84, 86, 88, it went up to Mexico. And in this border right here, this is where we first identified the Africanized honeybee in uh, Texas in 1990. So in, in 1990, in 1985, around that area is when, uh, time is when uh, the Africanized honeybee was first um, recorded in Mexico. And then because they were so close, such close neighbors, the USDA um, Agricultural Research Station, because they have such a vigilant eye for invasive species, they um, had to hire or pay a lot of the USDA scientists to start putting swarm traps near the border with Mexico for the, what, they, what they knew was going to be the inevitable move of the Africanized um, honeybee to Texas. So they put these South Texas trap lines and they were able to record the first appearance of Africanized honeybees in 1990. And then after they captured Africanized honeybees in swarm traps, they would put these swarm buckets up in trees or in, uh, in poles or, or light poles, telephone poles, they started now noticing Africanization of managed uh, honeybee colonies. This is a, a kind of a diagram of our borderline with Mexico. So Mexico is here in the south. And all of these areas of Texas around this area had all of those swarm traps. And they, it was first located um, near the border with Hidalgo, Mexico uh, in 1990. As of 2011, all of these counties in the southern United States 
had been reported with having Africanized honeybees. As of about 10 years ago in the state of Texas, there was still a quarantine that, such that people would be able, if they encounter a very um, aggressive colony, they had the ability to send in honeybee samples to a lab that was actually close to where, it, the, uh, where I work in College Station, Texas, and they would get their uh, bees tested for free for Africanization. Back then, though, they would have to do it morphometrically. So they would have to take uh, the wing patterns, they would have to weigh the bees, take the venation patterns in the wings, and determine with some degree of confidence whether or not those bees had uh, become <coughs> Africanized. Because about 10 years ago, uh, every county in the state of Texas had reported Africanized honeybees, the quarantine was taken down and uh, it is now assumed that all the bees in, in the state of Texas, unless they're managed and you bring in a European stock from other states that are not Africanized yet, uh, you can assume that all the bees that are collected that are kind of aggressive in the state of Texas are Africanized. Therefore, they no longer have that diagnostics, diagnostics lab anymore. So um, that some people have, of course, issues with that because they want to know if their bees are Africanized or not. But, all we can tell them is that if they're aggressive, you can assume that they are Africanized and that you need to either get rid of that colony if it's really aggressive or requeen immediately. And that has created a completely uh, changed uh, playing field for the business of swarm removal and collection and people keeping swarms like they do here in the UK or in other parts of, of, of the USA where we don't have issues with a, uh, Africanized honeybees, it's way more difficult and more expensive to remove Africanized honeybee swarms from structures because of the potential danger for attacks. So Africanization, both in South America and then into Central and North America, became a double-edged um, sword. The release, the original release, was a huge success in many ways because it uh, indeed at the end, we found out later that it did help improve the honey production in the states, uh, in the Sao Paulo state in Brazil, but it brought a lot of new issues that you can probably all imagine. First, there was a very big fear that it would displace the native bees because they are such successful foragers compared to some strains of honeybees, depending on where they are located um, on the map that they were, the, uh, all the naturalists, scientists, they were, and beekeepers were, were worried about them displacing native bees um, because of competition at natural uh, food sources. It almost eliminated hobbyist beekeeping and it did so in South America, Central America. It has done some of that in North America because of the fear of uh, aggressive behavior, which is well-founded in many ways. Um, because of the, it takes the fun out of beekeeping because you have to put on so many layers. You have to be so careful at keeping bees. Um, you can always have that risk of getting attacked really badly if you have any leak in your suit. So it took away the fun of beekeeping that a lot of people um, enjoy. And so it, it almost eliminated hobbies beekeeping at the beginning in every country uh, once it, it got, um, once they Africanized honeybee uh, came in. There was also a lot of losses of livestock in, in particular and also on humans uh, with stinging deaths and stinging related incidents. So we in the state of Texas unfortunately have a, anywhere from two to four uh, bee related deaths per year that are uh, because of uh, Africanized honeybees that were not known to be in a particular area, and it's typically <coughs> in the countryside where farmers are mowing their lawns or using machinery that vibrates the soil and it gets the bees agitated and immediately they go and sting and it's a, it's a big problem uh, in all of the southern states. There was little initial profit about bee in beekeeping because you had to buy so much more equipment to keep Africanized honeybees. Also, Africanized honeybees abscond at a very high rate. So it's hard to keep them in a box. They don't have the same nesting biology as typical European um, species or subspecies. 
for many ways because they really don't need to store all that food for winter. They come from areas where there isn't a, a, a true winter. And so they don't really need to uh, keep that nesting cavity uh, with all the resources uh, kept. And also, their colonies are smaller, typically, and so they can just go and nest in kind of a subpar, any kind of subpar cavity or even just crevice or, or nook and cranny and stay there temporarily because they will abscond or, or swarm uh, thereafter anyway. So they don't really need a good quality cavity like European bees do. And the resources that honeybees, the Africanized honeybees um, uh, collect is much lower in rate, as I just said. So the resources are really just for the the day-to-day uh, -day consumption by the brood and the adults, and so they don't store a lot of honey. So it's not fun for a beekeeper that is interested in just honey collection, for instance. So why did Africanized honeybees spread so quickly and have spread so quickly? And now they were slowing down in, in the USA, but mostly because of um, uh, the temperature and the elevation uh, changes going north, um, so latitudinal constraints is what's keeping the Africanized honeybee moving at a slower rate northward in North America than was originally predicted. Their high swarming rate is one of those. They have uh, drone production year round, typically, because again, they come from areas where they don't have true winters, so there are drone genes out there flying around trying to mate with, um, or drones that have the genes from the Africanized honeybee colony that are trying to mate with European queen, and so they will hybridize at a higher rate. They are also, uh, they like to usurp or take over directly. They will sometimes rob out colonies of European strain bees and take over the nesting cavity and stay there, and then the queen will start laying her eggs, and suddenly they, it has become their new home. They uh, will deplete the environment off of resources. And once there is environmental food depletion, they will move on to the next area. Whereas the European honeybee sometimes struggles because they want to stay in that cavity. And so they might have either a drop in weight or a complete disappearance of the colony in the winter if they don't have enough food. And one that's very important and that we're just starting to figure out is uh, or the mechanisms of. They have a higher tolerance for, toward varroa mites and therefore it is presumed that they have a lower transmission of varroa vector viruses and that have lower incidence of disease overall. And I will talk about a project that we're doing right now with Africanized honeybees uh, and Nozema, amongst other things. So I will answer or talk about more about Nozema coming up <coughs> shortly, which so the, the questions that you had about Nozema during um, uh, Debbie's talk might get answered by the study that we're doing with Africanized honeybees and Nozema. So there are different climates and environments for tropical versus uh, temperate regions uh, and, and their species overall. In the tropical regions, you have, as I said, a wet or dry season with variable dearths, and so they have more like patchy resources, but a milder weather overall. So they're less uniform uh, resources, and therefore the species, in this case the Africanized honeybee, but it can be any other species, has to move from spot to spot more often to go to those patchy uh, resource locations. As I said earlier, they also have a large diversity of predators and parasites, so they have to be equipped biologically to combat all of these. And therefore, they have that extreme defensiveness behavior that is critical to deter all of those predators. And nest abandonment, or absconding, is rewarded by better resources at a new place where the resources have not been depleted, or, if, or going to an area where <laughs> Uh, living in an area where there are longer foraging seasons compared to temperate regions where you have long cold winters, you have more or less um, uniform dearths and times of plenty uh, full to, uh, food to forage, so they will take on these longer periods of, of food availability and store all of that surplus for the moments or the times of um, dearth. They have 
limited predator and parasite populations compared to those in the tropics. Nest abandonment is often fatal, especially because in the cold months they will freeze to death if they abandon the nest, so they will not dare to, ne uh, to abandon the nest as much as Africanized honeybees or any species that lives in a commune or in a nest in uh, tropical areas. So because they have fewer parasites and predators, they have uh, that, that extreme defensiveness is less critical. If you want to kind of break down the differences between temperate and tropical um, environments and the bees that live in them, I don't really want need to go through all of these, but there are differences in ne nest architecture. For instance, the temperate uh, weather uh, subspecies are, have larger colonies compared to the tropical ones. They have more honey storage compared to the tropical ones. They don't, they're having exposed nests is very rare compared to tropical ones where sometimes it is common, especially um, in, in times of, of when there's no food and they really need to abscond. So there's, absconding is very rare in the, tropical, in the temperate um, subspecies compared to the tropical ones. Temperate ones have moderate colony defense mechanisms compared to the intense defense mechanisms of the tropical ones, etc. There are also differences in worker characteristics, how long they take to develop, how long they live, at what age they become foragers, and the overall body size. And there are differences in the foraging behavior, how, whether they have a high probability or a low probability of collecting pollen, collecting nectar, collecting water, or collecting sucrose from nectar at different concentrations. So for example, uh, temperate weather uh, species because they, during the time of uh, food availability, there is so much food out there, they will be pickier as far as how sweet they want their nectar to be, to collect if they have uh, their druthers. But in the tropical region, because food is sparse and patchy, they, the bees will go for nectar of almost any concentration just because that they need that uh, carbohydrate source, source. Let's talk a little bit more about absconding because uh, this is, I mean, this is a behavior that happens in other, in many biological, uh, in, in, in organisms, in animals, but in bees, people, beekeepers learn this term, this very kind of technical term of absconding, which is basically colony abandonment. It happens uh, from disturbance, from predators, parasites, fire. So, of course, uh, if, you, if you talk to beekeepers, uh, they... Some will say, and I think there's some truth to this, that uh, the smoking behavior that we use the smoker for is that the bees uh, become in a quiescent state because they, are, they have this natural instinct of behaving this way um, prior to a fire, if they were uh, kind of coming into a fire situation out in the wild. So absconding occurs within hours of that disturbance and the nest is completely destroyed. It can also be resource induced. So 30 to 80% of colonies abandon the nest in times of dearth, as far as Africanized honeybees. Of course, this is all Africanized honeybee, to seek out new resources. And absconding is timed such during times where brood rearing is not very common. So there's not a whole lot of brood to lose if they leave the whatever little brood that is being reared when, uh, in, in their temporary home, they choose to leave typically during times where their brood rearing is not that high. And also they do it when there's a young a population of young workers. Remember I've been talking a little bit about young workers and, and swarming. It happens also in Africanized honeybees because they need to be um, young enough that they will have a couple of weeks in their lives to go and build new comb for the new um, resting place where they're going to have uh, start the kickstart the brood rearing situation. Kind of very similar to swarming. As far as defensive behavior, which is the infamous way in which Africanized honeybees are known, they initiate the defensive mechanism at lower threat thresholds. So that's one of their things, that they assess whatever it is that honeybees um, uh, fear as far as predation uh, uh, impact, for example. The, the Africanized honeybee will have a lower threshold for that defensive behavior toward predation. 
so it will act faster at lower thresholds. Um, so they're four to ten times more likely to sting compared to European honeybees, although some European honeybees also have very high uh, likeliness of, of stinging, depending on what strain. And they also have a greater number of bees that participate in the, nesting in the stinging behavior. 10 to 30 times more bees participate in these mobbing, stinging behaviors in Africanized honeybees compared to European honeybees. And they will pursue the victim, typically the beekeeper, for longer distances. 100 meters, 1,000 meters, even more than 1,000 meters. I did uh, some work with Africanized honeybees in the very cute, tiny country of Belize in Central America. And um, we knew that these colonies were Africanized. We didn't know um, exactly how well managed they were. It turns out that these in particular were not very managed at all because of their aggressive behavior. And we had to put on our suits in the truck about half a kilometer from where the bees were so that we could even enter the apiary uh, and, and not get basically stung to death just before even entering the apiary. Once we worked with the bees, we had a veil of bees all over our suits. Very, very kind of scary scenario of you only having this layer of clothing and a veil in front of, of the potential of getting stung by hundreds of bees. We managed the bees with these veils of, of, or curtains of bees trying to sting us. And then when we were done, we would have to walk out with our suits on, go the other half a kilometer to the, uh, to the truck, get on in the truck, get in the truck, and drive off, and we would still have followers a couple of kilometers away. That really doesn't happen with European honeybees. They are just <laughs> their threshold for, for per, uh, pursuing a victim or for defending their nest is much wider. So they, they, will, they will try to defend that nest for a lot, much, much uh, longer distance. Um, the guards remain around guarding for longer periods of time. So there's always guarding behavior out and menacing uh, defensive behavior. And their guards themselves are also much more likely to go out and, and sting um, than compared to some most European, uh, well-managed European strains, I should say. So there's a genet definitely a genetic component with singing behavior. This is the typical uh, leather patch stinging test that you do to measure defensiveness in, in honeybees in general. You can do it with European honeybees. You can try it with yours. If this is a fun uh, type of experiment that you can publish if you do enough of these stinging tests. But you can take these patches of leather. Why leather? Because it's the closest thing we would have to putting a skunk in front of the hive or an arm in front of an... So it's, it's, it looks very similar to skin, and that's what they're going for because typically most of these predators are, are, are furry animals. And then you can uh, put a string on either side of this, of this square of leather, and then you put it right in front of the hive, and then you have to be very pragmatic about how you are doing this. Every time you have to be consistent about your number of stumps or the number of things that you're going to do to a hive to get it kind of aroused. So you count the number of times, you know, it's always doing it the same, touching the hive or maybe hitting it with a stone or your hive tool or something, five times or something, and then count the number of stings that you will see on that piece of leather. Uh, this is what you will, this is the kind of stinging that would happen if you were not we wearing that suit in front of an Africanized honeybee colony, typically. Sometimes they're gentle and I'll talk about that, more gentle, I'll talk about that later. So that defensive behavior, that particularly, the particular, in particular, the likelihood to sting is genetically dominant or additive. So if you have any Africanized genes they are dominant over the likelihood to sting or be more defensive will be dominant over being gentle. That's why it's a problem with any kind of hybridization because gentleness is, is more of a, 
uh, it's not dominant compared to being aggressive. The size and the defensive behavior is not genetically linked, so there is no link between either the size of the colony and likelihood to sting or the size of the bees, uh, unlike what some people think. So most morphological characteristics of the bee are no longer useful for predicting defensive behavior, especially because when you have this hybridization, you're gonna have kind of, if you have a small bee on this end and a big bee on this end, if you're hybridized, you're kind of having all the colors of the rainbow and then you can't assess whether a bee of a certain size is gonna have a higher or lower likelihood of becoming defensive. So therefore, it's not a good scheme to have uh, breeding programs that are solely based on the size of the bee. Typically, African bees or bees of African descent are smaller in size compared to uh, bees of European descent. But again, <coughs> we have a hybrid. We don't have the two extremes. So any kind of breeding um, mechanism based on size is just not very um, successful. Now, not surprisingly, older bees tend to sting more than younger bees. Remember, we have division of labor, and the oldest bees are first guards, then foragers. So the older the bees, the more likely they're going to be to sting. Although all bees can sting once they emerge, unless they're one-day-old babies. And so you can artificially determine how likely young bees are to sting, for example, and that's what um, a study done by Jirai and all did. They tested the hypothesis that colonies with a higher population of older workers will have a higher likelihood of producing the stinging behavior compared to colonies that have a population, typical population of young workers. And again, they did that sting assay that I told you where they put the piece of leather in front of the hive and they strike it for a couple of times um, and you always have to put the piece of leather in the same height and the same distance from the entrance, etc. And then wave it in front for a, a certain time, time period and then see what you get. So what he did is he created these artificial colonies where the <coughs> ratio of workers that were young versus old was not the natural ratio. He added, artificially either added a lot of old workers or added a lot of, a lot of young workers uh, to these artificial colonies to see how likely they were to um, sting, sorry. He just saw what kind of is um, not surprising that in colonies with the old uh, worker population, there was a, a, almost a fourfold increase in defensive behavior compared to the ones with the young workers. So um, foragers and guards are the ones that we uh, can be afraid of in Africanized honeybee <coughs> colonies. So how dangerous are Africanized honeybees? Or honeybee stinging events in general, but we'll go into the Africanized honeybee one in, in detail. Here we have a table uh, that looked at the, the uh, animal-related fatalities in the United States from 1991 to 2001. So you have here um, hornet, bees, and wasps, and you have uh, 533 deaths which in, within that 10-year period, uh, accounting for about 30% of all uh, fatalities that were animal related in the United States. Almost three times as high as dog, dog bites and dog related deaths. Um, other venomous arthropods, spiders, non-venomous arthropods. Scorpions right here at only like a quarter of a percent. Rats, <laughs> venomous marine animals, and other animals. So. Um, Honeybees and wasps and stinging insects are up there as far as the animal-related deaths in the United States. <clears throat> as far as honeybee-related deaths, we have seen an increase in the number of massive stinging reports uh, going from 1996 all the way to 2007, which coincides with the increase in proportion of Africanized honeybees uh, across the United States. And here we have almost an uh, uh, 
five-fold increase as of 2007 in the number of deaths that resulted from these stinging incidents. So it is a point of concern that uh, the more areas with Africanization, the higher likelihood that you will have um, some bee-related accidents, at stinging events, and even deaths. But because there is no uh, honeybee anti-venom, the treatment of the symptoms is the only way to care for people that get affected by these very severe um, honeybee stinging insects or allergic reactions. So two things can happen if you have Africanized honeybee accidents. You can have the indirect action, which typically just causes an allergic reaction if you're lucky enough to not be allergic to honeybees, that can be very local or can be systemic, but that you can take care of with ointments and antihistamines and then you are typically okay. Or you have a direct action and have a toxic reaction that can be localized or more systemic with multiple sting um, and venoming and becoming completely sick and even being uh, potentially going into anaphylactic shock and then uh, and dying from the related, um, uh, the physiological responses to, to the toxic reaction. So how do people prevent this uh, very scary stinging uh, uh, event uh, if you're in front of an Africanized honeybee colony? And this is taken from a lot of books in Central and South America that are uh, educating the farming community about the dangers of Africanized honeybees. Of course, don't provoke the colonies. Don't be, like, you know, Back in the day, boys would go and, and throw rocks at, at nests of wasps and bees and just trying to be boys and playing around. You don't do that anymore in the areas where Africanized honeybees are because you're not going to get stung by five bees or ten bees. You're going to get stung by hundreds, potentially. You can also bee-proof your home. And if you encounter the bees, you should run as fast as you can away and get indoors as fast as possible. That's the, basically the best advice you can get. You should cover your mouth and face with your shirt. And so all of your orifices is the first thing they go for. It's amazing how quickly they will find these orifices and then they'll not only try to sting you, but they'll go inside. So as soon as you start screaming or something, then they will go in your, in your mouth and start stinging you through your esophagus, etc. So you don't want to do any, uh, you want to cover yourself as much as possible. Don't swat or crush them because as I just told you, they have a higher uh, sensitivity to any kind of uh, menacing behavior. So they will go, they will, it would only increase their uh, likelihood of releasing the alarm pheromone that will get them to sting you even more. If you're near a, a water source, don't jump in the water. They will out swim you, basically. You'll be in there, probably in pain, and then as soon as you get out of the water, they'll be there waiting for you because remember, they will be waiting uh, for a long period of time at long distances. So the initial impact of, uh, of these Africanized honeybees to beekeeping uh, were uh, several. As I said, beekeepers went out of business. Hobby beekeepers basically stopped keeping bees for fun. In Brazil, the original country of introduction, beekeeping dropped by t uh, to only 10% of their former values. And honey production re was reduced by 3,000 tons uh, per year, so a 40% drop in honey production. But a lot of that had to do with the fact that so many beekeepers were leaving the business of keeping bees, so there were not as many colonies because of, of the attrition. But the beekeeping industry bounced about 10 years later. It takes about this long for an area that gets an introduction of Africanized honeybees in, learn how to keep bees with, that are Africanized because it's a completely different uh, management uh, uh, culture. And then once you learn how to keep them and then you don't become as afraid of keeping them in a good way, then you will start seeing the, the um, their positive aspects of keeping Africanized honeybees. So production went up by about 50,000 tons of honey per year. And beekeeping became more expensive, so did the cost of honey in many ways. And, but because production went up, they were able to overcome those initial costs. As I said, um, 
So there were, again, some more initial impacts of beekeeping. The apiaries had to be isolated from people and livestock, like the one in Belize that I just told you about. No one, very few people know there's an apiary there because the owner doesn't want to advertise that they have very deadly, very aggressive bees nearby, although their neighbors kind of know, um, but, but he ha you have to keep that in the hush-hush. The apiaries had to be smaller and more spread out to prevent these horrible explosions because it is kind of a chain event that once one colony goes, the alarm pheromone is going to tri trigger the other ones to also go in and attack. Then people started purchasing more and more smokers and very different kinds of uh, smokers and uh, had to be purchased. And now in areas with Africanized honeybees, uh, working uh, bees takes a team of people. So it's not just one person keeping the bees. Typically in Brazil you have two people at the hive or more. One person, her or his only job is to use the smoker. And the size of these smokers is maybe two or three times the size of a regular smoker. So that's one of the management practices that has completely changed. You have to use a lot of smoke, you have to smoke them way before you even get approach the hive. You have to keep smoking them at all times. You have to be so gentle, you know, taking out up and, and uh, the covers <coughs> out and, and the frames out. You only keep frames out for the lowest amount of time needed to do whatever task you're doing and then you have to gently put everything back. So you, in many ways, become a very a much more cautious beekeeper. But if you take on all of these um, uh, new management techniques into account and you practice them uh, consistently, then you can start making uh, good production and seeing all the benefits of keeping Africanized honeybees. In, in Brazil, the, the, the quintessential place for how to learn how to keep Africanized honeybees, uh, the beekeeper not only protects himself, but he has to protect whatever animals and, and people that you, they're taking with them to keep anim, anim, um, honeybees. So you not only have to spend money on, on protecting yourself, you have to spend money on protecting your, um, your livestock, including the donkey beekeeper that takes all the honey away from where the bees are. There have been some environmental impacts of Africanized honeybees. There is not a lot of evidence that there is a population decline in native bees because of the introduction of the Africanized honeybee into an environment. Instead, what we think is causing the, uh, the decline in native bee population has a myriad of other causes, including um, habitat fragmentation and suitable foraging overall. Not that the honeybee, the Africanized honeybee, was the one that caused the native bee populations to um, decline. So contrary to uh, previous claims about honeybees in the United States, habitat destruction is more important in native bee declines than invasive com uh, competitors. Generalists change the proportions of pollen collected to avoid competition. That happens with honeybees. Um, so they will just go and try to locate pollen sources from different areas instead of specialist bees that will only go for one pollen type, that, uh, in which case they are more a danger of, of, uh, of declining because of fragmentation or loss of suitable foraging spots. And so in the, uh, on the other way, instead of being a generalist, you're a specialist that can, may get a boost from increased population of host plants due to uh, pollination by Africanized honeybees. So Africanized honeybees can be providing a pollination service of plants that are uh, keen for specialist bee population. So 20 years later, what has happened in the United States as far as the population of Africanized honeybees? When, uh, and I don't think I have time to talk about my Nozima study, but I can talk about it maybe tomorrow during the biology of the colony. That's a good uh, uh, add on to that, sorry, Saturday, add on to that talk because it's a cool, uh, cool thing. But 
Africanized honeybees in Texas appeared in this feral population of bees that we have been studying, well, collaborators and then I, I started also studying since 1993. So remember the Africanized honeybee got there in 1990. So they were able to locate a population of feral bees that had um, mostly bees of European descent. And then over time, it became more and more and more Africanized. So um, here in the black bars are the proportion or the number of colonies in this particular area of Texas that had um, bees of maternal Apis mellifera scutellata descent or African descent. In 1993, there were only uh, maybe two colonies that had, um, um, and this is done with mitochondrial DNA analysis, which is maternally inherited. So you know where the maternal ancestry of that colony came from. So they started in 1991 and 92, there were no Scutellata bees, they were mostly Lamarckii, Western European, Eastern European bees. Then they started creeping up, and by 2001, uh, the, the, the number of colonies of Africanized, um, African maternal ancestry um, had gone up by about a fivefold. Our current data, which is uh, in, in press right now for the, uh, for this scientific study has showed that in, by 2013, 95% of that population had become fully Africanized. And now only 5% of the colonies that live in that area are European. So definitely the Africanized uh, maternal ancestry is taking or has taken over the European population in, that, in those feral uh, bees. And the same kind of pattern has been seen in Arizona, which was also one of the first states that uh, reported a lot of Africanization in the United States. Uh, they started off in 1994 with having zero Africanized mitochondrial DNA in their colonies, and it has gone up to almost 80 to 90% by 2000, probably way more right now. So the uh, percent of African uh, maternal ancestry has gone up to about 80% by 2000. So 20 years later, Africanized bees are here to stay, not here, but in the United States and in the Americas. <coughs> Strong public education helps manage all of these uh, massive stinging effects, all this, the information that I gave you about what to do if, in the event of being near an Africanized honeybee colony is what uh, apiary inspectors and cooperative extension agents have to uh, relay to the public so that they know about the dangers um, and how to prevent them. Beekeeping education and coordinated breeding programs will select out defensive behavior and now there's some populations of Africanized honeybees in some Caribbean con countries, uh, especially Puerto Rico, that have now called this type of bee the gentle Africanized honeybee or little g AHB for the type of bee that has, br they've done this breeding to take out the defensive mechanism, but keeping the higher honey production in these populations of Africanized honeybees to the point where their beekeeper is able to keep these bees in a way that would be very um, um, similar to that of European honeybees. And uh, some of the promise of good production by Africanized honeybees has been realized in the United States. So uh, we, my beekeeper, uh, has been keeping bees in, in my area of Texas for 30 years. Uh, so he worked with, of course, European honeybees before the, the uh, Africanized honeybee got there. His bees are fully Africanized. I mean, I'd say fully in that every colony he owns has some level of Africanization. Yes, they are more aggressive. Yes, you have to suit up really well to manage these bees, but they're manageable and they have lower incidence of varroa overall than European honeybees, to a point where he does not treat for varroa in his apiary. And not everyone can, um, can do that in the United States nowadays without having a really high winter mortality. But he sticks to the claim that I think is, is true in many ways, that Africanized honeybees are hardier, they have a better colony defense mechanism that allows them to survive all of these uh, predator pathogen pressures. So on Saturday, I will talk about the prevalence of Nozema, that microsporidian gut pathogen, in that feral population of honeybees um, in, in southern Texas. I just want to say 
that again, if you want to learn more about Africanized honeybees, if you want to come visit Texas <laughs> and play with Africanized honeybees, you're more than welcome to, so you can just uh, leave us a message on our Facebook page, which is uh, quite popular. Um, and I would like to thank Man Lake UK, the British beekeepers, uh, especially Simon, the National Honey Show participants, and you for your attention. Have the Africanized bees uh, had any reaction with the small hive beetle? Has any surveys been done on that? So that someone just asked me that question about the relation between um, Africanized honeybees and small hive beetles. And the answer is no. Now, a lot of people have done work on small hive beetles in the United States that have populations that are truly Africanized. Most of the work is done in managed apiaries where the bees are, have been, um, where the queens are fully European. So that there's a lot that we don't know about the biology of Africanized honeybees in the United States with the pests and pathogen pressures of the United States using Africanized honeybees because they are so difficult to uh, manage. So we have small hive beetle in Texas, but again, we, most beekeepers, the queen, even the queen producers in Texas, they don't have a huge problem with small hive beetle. I mean, we have it, but they are not losing their colonies to small hive beetle, potentially because the Africanized honeybee has better defense mechanisms against these pests. But the answer is no. There is no study that I know in the United States that has looked um, quantitatively at how honeybees, uh, Africanized honeybees, uh, manage small hive beetle uh, populations. How does the Africanized honeybee deal with Varroa? How does it, is it cleanliness? What is how it? How does the Africanized honeybee deal with Varroa? And that's uh, a loaded question, yes, 64,000 pound <laughs> question. Um, it, behaviorally, they have several lines of attack. Their absconding rate is the most important one. Because they, well, their absconding rate and their aggressiveness. So they're more aggressive, they're also, more, they have a higher rates of grooming and hygienic behavior. So they will get rid of, of their foretic mites and also ones in the brood area. But swarming is a strategy that allows them to get ri rid of or leave behind brood that has most of those mites in the brood cells like Debbie talked about. So all they're bringing with them when they're absconding um, is the foretic mites. And so it stops the cycle of the, of the, of the mite the development. Do they abscond? I mean, you said it's a higher rate. But it depends. They can abscond as soon as they get depleted of resources. Sometimes they will stay in an area if there's a lot of food around for months at a time, but they can abscond maybe uh, within a few weeks between each other, and then they will abscond again, and they will abscond again. So again, their colonies are smaller. They have smaller patches of brood, and every time they abscond, they leave that brood behind, potentially all the brood Pathogens, not just varroa, but all the pathogens are in the in the infected uh, brood. Um, there is but not one uh, varroa type. The varroa type in South America, of in America, is different from the varroa uh, population, the varroa mite in Europe. So uh, he can handle them better because. One of the reasons is probably that it is an ever stain of varroa mite. Oh, yeah. It's not the same. Yeah, they're not. They're different stains of varroa. Yes, you're right. And uh, some people are probably studying the different population genetics of varroa. We're not in our lab, but uh, I, I do agree that there's probably big differences behaviorally uh, between varroa strains in different parts of uh, in different continents. Yes, that's a good question. <laughs> 